Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this little guy right here. This is the A2 Knives A5 Tonto. First off, though, I want to thank very sincerely my uh, my buddy Andrew for sending this guy along. He donated this knife to the channel in exchange for uh, when I sell it, the money goes to charity, which is great. So thank you so much for that, Andrew. Next thing, let's do a little size comparison here. Um, This is actually not a very large knife. Uh, here it is against the Ontario Rat Number 2 in D2 Steel and the Ontario Rat Number 1, so you can take a look here and see, you know, yeah, it's a nice small size. And in fact, in terms of blade length, this guy is coming in right under three inches. So that's that's a, a very nice little size here. And of course, uh, here is your Spydeco Delica for comparison and another small three inch flipper, the uh, Steel Wheel Knives Cut Jack. So you can see, yeah, again, it's in that sort of ballpark. Not a big uh, knife here. Next thing, A2. Um, who, who is A2? Well, A2 is Andre Thorburn and Andre Van Heerden. They're both very well-known makers out of South Africa. They both do incredible work, and this is a collaboration between the two of them where they make these together, um, and I believe everything is handmade, or at the very, uh, and so, you know, it's, they, they, this is a very interesting series of knives. You'll see many A2 knives out there. Each one is going to be subtly different, and they have a variety of different, but this is an A5, and it is the Tanto model, uh, and so that's, that's very neat, um, and so anyways, let's go on ahead and jump into the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly of your A2, A5 Tanto here. So on the good side, first off, as I was just saying, this is made, uh, I believe, by hand, by two hugely well-known makers. Um, uh, uh, Thorburn and Van Heerden are both very well known in South Africa and around the world and so for some people this may be a huge perk it's not a big deal for me personally and in fact I tend to consider customicity to be more of a liability than anything but you know what it, it is a nice little thing and it's a piece of knife making history if you will next thing size on this guy is very nice you're coming in right around 3 inches and that's a nice legal size for a bunch of people and the knife on the whole is actually not all that big it's a little on the thick side 100% we'll talk about that later. But in terms of size in the pocket, this guy is relatively small here. About the same size as the Delica, even including the rather prominent pocket pack and flip a tab on there. So that's nice. Next thing, this has some very nice G10 inlay work. I'm going to see if I can kind of show you this, but you can see they've got these little blue lines in here, and there are other versions out there. There's one that's got like a little heartbeat line or something like that. I mean, look, this is a very, very nice piece of inlay work. It's beautifully sanded off here. The G10 is actually contoured, uh, which is a nice thing. I, I like very much this inlay work in the G10 on the whole because you kind of get a little bit of a topographic map effect because you see the layers on the G10 being gradually exposed there so that's great next thing this has a full back spacer so you can see here the entire back of the knife is covered as opposed to many modern knives which are using a flow through design um, I kind of like a full back spacer not only does it make sure that the blade is absolutely unexposed um, and keep this area free but it just it looks nice and it prevents lint and gunk and whatnot so I like that very very much Next thing, the clip on this guy is very good. Um, it has a, a, a good amount of tallness to it. It's also got a great amount of ramp. This is a very easy clip to use, and it holds the knife nicely in the pocket here. I can't argue with that at all. Next thing in, it looks pretty good, too, with little holes in there. Next thing, there are a lot of nice details about this knife, 100%. Ranging from, they have very nice etching on here. I mean, you can see the detail of this etching is great. Or even if I try and zoom in a little bit here... Yeah, that's very nicely done etching, um, and that's good. Uh, you also get things like a detent ramp on the blade here. Um, the liner coloration, any A2 knife, uh, I think it's kind of a signature, this light blue liner coloration. It is a very nice color, honestly. It's It, it really does... I don't know, it's just desaturated enough to be like blue sky beautiful. It's it's nice. Um, the machine work on this guy is profoundly clean. If we take a look at the jimping on the top of the blade here, holy crap is that clean. It's just, it's nicely done in that way. The uh, Overall, it's well machined. The, the G10 topography I showed off a little bit here. The backspacer is a nice smooth surface here. You even get these little holes in the flipper tab along with this nice jimping here, and which again is done pretty cleanly. And I like those because it makes the flipper tab a little bit more interesting. When you've got a nice prominent flipper tab on other knives, it has a tendency just to look like a big protrusion of metal. But no, the, the holes give it a little bit more visual intrigue, and even the holes are chamfered there. 
That's nice. And so there were a lot of nice little details on this guy. And then finally, on the good side, I love the blade on this because it has a great blade in a couple of ways. I mean, first off, as a cutting tool, it is reasonably thin behind the edge, especially out in the middle here. Um, it has a nice blade shape that is sort of a utilitarian tanto. You've got a flat area and then a little bit more curvature at the top here. The reason I say it's more utilitarian, tanto blades are great because they can give you a scraping and things like that. But this also has a little bit of curvature, which allows you to sharpen it a little bit more... Uh, readily in guided systems, for instance, than ones that have a, you know, flat corner there, because it can be easy to round that off and whatnot. So I like this blade shape very, very much. It's got a nice satin finish to the blade here. See if I can kind of show that off. And it's also got a little bit more polishing here. I'll see if I can show it off by wiping it off a little bit. It's got a little bit more of a, uh, a polished look on the, the on the flat areas here. And so there are really different finishes to it overall. But the thing I like by far the most is the grind on this. Look at this swedge. Look at this beautiful whoop, swoopy down little swedge in there. And it interacts beautifully with this line. This grind is masterful. I love this grind so damn much. It is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And so um, to me, at least, that that is a beautiful thing. And on any other knife, it would be the great. Um, but this is a great blade, 100%. And the knife has, and the rest of the good is that the knife also has lots of really nice little details here. An excellent clip, a full backspacer, this nice G10 inlay work on both sides. Did I mention the pivot collar? Yeah, it's got a little G10 pivot collar inlay there, and is a nice size, and it's made by hand by some well-known makers. What is great about this knife, above and beyond that blade, which would be anywhere else, is the action. Seriously. You can hear the excellence of that action. It locks shut with just a beautiful sound. And Thorbird is a person who has been often described as tuning the sound of his knives. And this is great. I'm mean, coupled with the liner lock here, which has got plenty of access to the liner here, which makes it easy to open up. And then with the IKBS, it is a beautifully false shut knife as well, although still in that more hydraulic-y feeling that the IKBS has. This is using dual row Icomacorth bearing system. You saw that in the disassembly. Oh, God, did you see it in the disassembly? But look, this is one of the better actions out there. 100% this knife, especially after the tune-up, running on this nice light oil. Oh, my God, is this a nice action. And so to me, what is spectacular, what is really, really great about this knife, 100% is that action, which is absolutely in the top 1% of knife actions I've handled. Spectacular freaking work on this action. So that's the great, the action. The bad side, there are some bad things and some nitpicks as well. Um, one nitpick is that there is zero steel marking. They take a whole bunch of room to tell us that this is IKBS, but they don't write anywhere on the blade here what this steel is. Um, I Similar knives, actually, uh, that were made around the same time period and even with the same inlay type uh, were N690. And honestly, this feels a little bit like N690 in touching up the edge and uh, stropping and using it, frankly. Um, but that's not a great thing, especially in a knife that's not super well-known. It's not like a production-run knife knife, you need to tell people what steels you're using. That's useful information, and it's something that can very easily be lost to the sands of time, so to speak. So I, I'd like to see a steel marking on there. Next thing, the sharpening choil, unfortunately, is not quite there. If we look in closely here, yeah, you can see it kind of pops up a little bit there. The plunge is just a little bit longer there, uh, goes a little further out than the uh, sharpening choil does. It's not great the end of the world, but it's it's not great either. Um, next thing, there is some unevenness for sure in the backspacer area here. Uh, if we kind of, can I actually show this off? Basically, especially in this little region here, you very distinctly feel the G10, then the liner, then the G10 in the middle, then, then the other liner, then the G10. There's kind of a little gap and a ridge at every point there. This is a little detail, but when you get into these price points, these little details need to be gotten correctly. Even here, I think you can see some reflection off the liner there. Um, I'd like to see that a little bit more flush fit in the future, especially at these kinds of price points. But again, these are all nitpicks. Moving away from the nitpicks into something a little more real, um, the clip on this guy is an absolute hot spot. You've got this big clip ramp, which is great for getting the knife into the pocket, but not so great as you're actually bearing down on the knife because, well, it's just going to dig right into your hand here. It's not a great feeling, and it's something I didn't love using this guy. Um, the knife is also very thick. I mean, seriously, this is thicker than the Delica by a pretty good margin. Um, in fact, let's see here against the rat number one, which tends to be the thickest knife on my table. This is matching it almost exactly in terms of overall thickness. This is a, a absolutely a thick knife. 
And in a knife that's this small, that can be a little bit weird, a little off-putting. You put this in your pocket, it feels very different than usual. Uh, it's like, is that a Thorburn in your pocket? Uh, anyways, I'm not going there. Um, but this is a very thick little knife, and that's not something that I loved in carrying it. And unfortunately, the blade stock is also very thick, and that's something that really did bother me a fair amount. I mean, although it's ground well, and it will cut, certainly, um, it balloons out to full thickness pretty quickly. And so this is a knife that I found, especially for my kinds of cutting, which are, tend to be, you know, cutting apples and things like that. This kind of stock thickness is just never going to cut as effectively as this kind of stock thickness. And I mean, here against Delica, again, it's that same sort of, okay, yeah, why did it have to be this way, guys? If they'd have made this blade stock thinner, I would like this li uh, this knife a whole bunch more. Well, frankly, I'd like this life a little bit more, but, you know, it's a small part of life. Next thing, as you saw in the, um, the disassembly video, this knife is kind of a pain to take apart. Because not only are you taking out the pivot, then these two screws, but you're also taking out, I believe, three additional screws, all of which are T5. We're going to come back to that in the ugly, rest assured, but that's not a great thing. And then couple that with the dual row IKBS in there, this is an odyssey to di disassemble, and it's not something that's for the faint of heart. Uh, and so I'm not a big, big fan of that. And then finally, this is a very expensive knife. This is not a knife. I was not able to find a price for this exact piece, but there was one that was very, very similar um, on, a, uh, on a website that was for sale for 700 bucks. That's a lot of freaking money. And especially if this is N690 steel, that's a lot of money, and that's not something I love at this price point. I mean, N690 is fine. It works for everyday carry, and with a good heat treat, it can be pretty solid, but it's not a steel that I want at a super high-end price point. And it's also a hard-to-find knife is the other unfortunate thing. I mean, you can't just go out and buy one of these guys in the same sense you can go out and buy a Delica. It's the nature of custom knives, but uh, both of those consequences, I guess all three, that this is very expensive, that it's using a steel that's not that impressive for that price point, and that it's hard to find are not beautiful things. And so, I uh, that's the bad to me, is that it's pricey, hard to find, and using a steel that's not impressing me at that price, it's a, ta a pain to take apart. The blade stock is weirdly thick, and that does affect the cutting ability to it. It is pretty thick on the whole. The clip is absolutely a hot spot. And then a couple of nitpicks, like some unevenness here, the missed sharpening choil, and the lack of steel marking on this guy. Um, on the ugly front, there is one ugly thing, and it is indeed pretty ugly, and that is right here. We can see that it's using these little tiny T5 screws. T5 is just not cool. <laughs> um, uh, these are little tiny bits, and they have a tendency to strip out. They're, 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 it's not a good thing on any knife, but even more so on a knife that is made by two guys in South Africa. Um, that is scary to me, because if one of these bits strips out, especially even that it is a relatively small screw going into these liners, there's really not much of a chance. In fact, I tried to buy an A2 at one point in time, um, but it had a stripped screw in the scale that nobody could replace. Like, no one could find one, and, and the Thorburns weren't able to help. Yeah, well, Thorburns, I'm sorry, the Andres, A2, weren't able to help on it. That wasn't great. Um, or at least they couldn't get in touch. I don't remember what the story was. The seller was handling that. But the thing is, this is scary to me. And this is the kind of thing that actually inspired my long game knife gripe over at Knife News. When companies, uh, well, in this case, when random people build in an Achilles heel to the knives, a tiny little screw that is very possibly going to strip, uh, and there were two people on Earth who can service the thing, that's really, really unfortunate. And heck, the other A2 review I did had Threadlocker on here, so the knife wasn't going to be able to be taken apart. And that makes the thing disposable. I, I just, I hate seeing these Achilles heels on this. T6 is bad enough, but T5 should never be the case, especially on a knife where the maker isn't reliably going to be uh, quickly available for servicing. So to me, that is 100% the ugly, is that it's using these little tiny screws, and that has major consequences for long-term disassemblability of the guy and long-term maintenance. On the final conclusion front, look, this is 100% a beautifully made knife. I mean, seriously, look at that. Look at that. That's gorgeous. I love it. Um, and it is well finished. A lot of details. It's just incredible looking blade. Oh my god. And frankly, one of the better actions I have ever had in a pocket knife. This is a spectacular little piece, but it also has some serious annoyances to it. The, the thickness, uh, the, the expensiveness, the hard to find this, the maintenance, and the, the, the freaking blade thickness was just, to me, unfortunate. And ultimately, this is a knife that I'm very glad that I got to spend time with, because handling it very briefly, you know, when I first took it out of the box, I kind of fell in love. And in fact, I put this one aside in, in a large batch of donations. I held this one towards the end, thinking, okay, I'm going to reward myself, kind of one 
once I'm able to review all these, and it's a weird little thing. Look, I'm a lucky man. But it, uh, once I get through all the a lot of these other donations, I will finally do this one because I know I'm just going to love it. Um, uh, because handling it briefly, I mean, the action's great. The finishing's great. The blade is just so damn pretty. I thought I was going to be head over heels. I was pretty sure I was going to be buying this guy and making the charitable donation myself just to hold on to it. But after more extended use, carrying it a bunch of times, usually in like the evenings, uh, just kind of for fun, as I got close enough that I could, you know, do so without breaking my backs to myself and whatnot, I did kind of cool off on this guy a little bit, because although I still love the action and the blade, and even putting aside the maintenance issue, which maybe I'm overplaying a little bit, that's the thing I think about more than most, the blade thickness on this guy ended up feeling pretty off-putting for my kinds of cutting. For, you know, cutting into thick foam, this is just not a great thickness of blade. This is too damn thick thick, and the N690 just fails to impress me. I mean, it required regular stropping and touch-ups, and that that's not something I should be expecting, and then the price on top of all that is just, it's way up there, and I don't know that I could justify it, and given that, for me at least, custom made by two guys in South Africa is actually not a strength, but a weakness. That's not something I look for. Um, This just didn't end up making sense, and so final conclusion, there is a lot to love about this knife, and I absolutely respect the knife making involved here, and if you love the style, you love the origins of the, the, the makers of this guy, you appreciate the action and the details, and you don't mind the price, look, I can absolutely see this knife uh, just bringing you a lot of joy. But ultimately, uh, this is not an Eto that I would pay to buy myself. Sorry, that was really bad. Anyways, I hope this has been interesting to you. This is really a beautiful knife, and I will be sad to see it go at another level, but... Uh, yeah, very, very nice. Oh, God, this blade, that switch. Okay, I, I, I digress. Have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.